Good morning, guys. So how was breakfast today? Is it okay? All right. Very good. Look like they did a nice job. We sure appreciate uh, those who have been on the hospitality team. Thank you, Russ, for coordinating uh, the breakfast today, also the, the men's ministry team. I know there's been a lot of different individuals, whether it's with uh, helping with setup or, or publication, that takes a lot to, uh, to have something like this. And we're grateful for, for each of you. If, if you aren't typically part of Fellowship of Wildwood, we want to give you a special welcome uh, for coming. We're so glad that, that you came out today. Uh, we really believe that we have a, a, a great program in store for this morning. You'll notice on your table that there is uh, some different items that we'll be looking at today. Of course, we'll, uh, we've got a couple of speakers we're going to hear, and also we'll have a time uh, a little later. There may be some volunteers at your table that would be willing to, to lead in prayer, and we want to pray for any needs that, uh, that may be here uh, within our group as well. But uh, as we begin, I'd like us to, to bow together, and let's have a word of prayer and ask for God's blessing upon our time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a beautiful morning, and as we look out today, we just are reminded of your goodness and of your glory. You are a great creator, God, and you have displayed uh, your glory in your creation. And yet you are also a God who is very near to us, and you have drawn near through your Son, Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to know him and to walk with him, to have him as, as, as Lord and as Savior. And we pray, Father, that, that, that throughout this time that, uh, that we will be able to, to look to you, that we'll hear words of testimony that remind us of, of how, you, how you work in people's lives, how you change lives. And, uh, and how you have provided uh, all that we need. You, again, are a good God, and we thank you for each one that's able to be a part of our men's breakfast today. We pray also for those who will be speaking, that you will communicate through their words, and that you will give us ears to hear what you have for us. For, again, we just thank you for, for all of this provision, including the food that's been provided for us today. We ask your blessing now, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, today our first testimony is going to be from Matthew Masadi, and uh, every time that we have a men's breakfast, we like to have a testimony from one of our own men, just to get to know each other better, and uh, Matthew and his wife Alex have been, uh, they're actually newer members at Fellowship. They've been attending for a little over a year and uh, have joined as members recently. Uh, they have two children, Lily, a daughter who is four, and a son, Marco, who is two. And uh, if you will, uh, if, you, if you're here after the the, uh, the second service, you'll see see them uh, oftentimes in the lobby. Just a, just a wonderful family, cute little kids. Matthew is a man with a, a variety of interests and pursuits. And as I've gotten to know him, I, I I'm just amazed at all the different ways God has blessed him. He is uh, he has a love for philosophy, and uh, he has written some books. He's working on on his sixth published book right now. Uh, he's also a musician and has written and recorded uh, several songs uh, under his own label. But, uh, but he also has a day job. I guess that's what pays the bills, right? Uh, and he is the vice president of sales for PDI Technologies. And this is a company that provides uh, technology products for the petroleum industry, especially in convenience retail and the petroleum wholesale business. Matthew is a follower of Jesus Christ, and he is uh, involved in leading a men's Bible study that gets together every Tuesday morning. Uh, they go through different books of the Bible. They take one at a time, verse by verse. They go through, they discuss it, and I know that that has, uh, has been a big part of his, of his Christian journey. I know you're going to be blessed to hear his testimony today. Would you please join me in welcoming Matthew Masadi? morning, fellas. Uh, I'm Matthew. Um, Pastor Russ asked me to, uh, to, to come give my testimony, tell my story uh, of how I came to uh, living faith in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, so I guess I'll start from the, uh, the beginning. I'm uh, born into an Italian-American family. Both of my parents were raised uh, Roman Catholic and had converted to uh, a Protestant uh, dominant denomination. Um, we were, we were raised, I'm the oldest of five kids, uh, five kids, five and a half years. My folks didn't stand a chance. Um, <laughs> and we, we were raised going to, to church occasionally, maybe, you know, every other weekend or, or so. Um, by the time athletics kicked into full gear for five children, 
uh, the weekends kind of became devoted to that, and, and church became something that um, just kind of faded away into the, to the backdrop of really our whole family. Um, as, as Pastor Ryan said, um, I have uh, a deep interest in, in philosophy, sort of always had, um, since I was a, a youngster. And, and growing up, I had questions, um, and sometimes questions that my folks um, had a hard time, you know, giving me a, a sufficient answer. Um, when I was nine years old, I asked uh, Jesus um, into my heart. Um, I was, you know, sort of led to in a, in a Sunday school setting, um, but I'm not sure I totally comprehended what that meant. I remember looking in the mirror, um, wondering, you know, precisely where in me is Jesus. Um, and I do believe that 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 that, that spark is, is, is all that, that kept me from the abyss. Um, as adolescence went on, I was kind of a ringleader of a pretty mischievous group of guys. Um, and, you know, was kind of full-on athletics, um, kind of living two different lives. Um, you know, definitely had, um, like, like girls a lot. Um, hence, you know, Brian mentioned I'm a musician. People say, you know, when did you uh, decide to play guitar? I say, well, puberty. When, when I realized girls like guys who, who play guitar. Uh, um, by the time I was um, a junior in college at University of Missouri-St. Louis, uh, pursuing my degree in philosophy, um, I, I had been working at this, this gym here in West County uh, since I was 17 years old. Uh, the gym was a cool gym. I couldn't afford a membership, so I could work one shift a week, um, and then I could train there for free. <laughs> Uh, it was owned by uh, some, I'll just try and say this as politically correct as I can, some nefarious people from uh, the Eastern Bloc, so kind of former Soviet Union. They owned a, a handful of other businesses, um, you know, mostly cash, if you guys can kind of figure the story out, what, what, what they were up to. Um, and they asked me if I would um, consider, I'm 21 years old at the time, if we give you um, a stipend to outfit this um, underground Russian banquet facility uh, into a nightclub, would you be interested? So I was. Um, <laughs> and uh, we created a, a, uh, an underground rock and roll club that was uh, kind of the thing for about three and a half, four years. The uh, government started to, to kind of get a hold of what was going on with the owners, and the, the wheels started to fall off of... Uh, that, that business um, as they became indicted and so forth. And so I made my way down to um, Soulard, where um, I ran another club for a few years, um, had my rock and roll band, and basically lived out um, hedonism to the, the full. So sex, drugs, rock and roll. Um, and, you know, in that decade of darkness, um, still, you know, continuing to study constantly, but it was all the apocrypha. It was never the scriptures. It was never the truth. It was not even the, what I would call the philosophers of, of light. It was the dark philosophers. So Nietzsche, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Spinoza. Um, and I found myself kind of at the, at the end of this time, um, I would say borderline suicidal. I, I just didn't have anywhere to go. Voices in my head would say things like, how disappointed would the eight-year-old version of you be in you? Um, and in, in sort of a pit of despair, I had purchased um, these two tickets to a Radiohead concert, um, and I had to buy them in a pair. And so I'd ask my, my really good buddy, Colin Meisinger, who's not here uh, with us today, but he's also uh, a, a member here. He, he and his wife were baptized a few months ago. Um, so I asked Colin, I said, hey, you, you want to go? My brothers were coming in town. A bunch of, bunch of buddies were going. And the morning of, I just didn't even want to go. I couldn't even, like, I didn't want to face anybody. I didn't want to see anybody. I felt like an alien um, to those who I'd known longest. And at, at this Radiohead concert on May 14, 2008, I'm, I'm, I'm watching, like, musician, like, just greatness on stage. And I realized in that moment that, like, greatness, like, the way that I was rolling, like, I was, like, I would... I, the voice would tell me, like, you know, you're the king of almost. And I'm going, greatness is, is off the table, period. And I didn't, I did, I, for the first time, like, I'd always felt like I was called for something 
important, something significant. Like I had a purpose, but I just couldn't get out of my own way. Um, and, and then I realized this was, a, this was the, the, the really harsh thought was, dude, like mediocrity is off the table the way you're rolling. Um, and I don't know if in that moment um, there was this sort of a series of internal conversations God, like, used a jujitsu maneuver of my own pride and told me that he had called me for a purpose, that I did exist for a supremely important reason. And in this moment where time stood still, I gave my life back to, to Jesus Christ at a Radiohead concert on May 14, 2008. And... And so I was out here in West County because I was living downtown. And my brothers were in town, and this, they had left, and it was a Sunday. And I'd been there at my parents' house for several days now, 29 years old at the time. And I'm tossing the Frisbee with my, with my dad, and this was kind of the way that we, it was the way we played catch or whatever and talked. And, and I just said, hey, Pops, I, uh, <laughs> I've made a, a really good series of, of bad decisions. I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, but I just kind of know what I'm not going to do any longer. Is it okay if I come home and stay with you and mom for, it's, I, don't have, I don't know how long it's going to take, um, because I don't know what I'm going to do. I just know what I'm not going to do. And he said, I should see something happen. And it was just, a, it, was, it, I, it was the prodigal son. I mean, he ran to me and embraced me, and he gave me a you know, car to drive and some running shoes to get fit again. And... Um, I went back to work at the old gym under new ownership and started going to the, basically spent my whole time in two places where bad stuff stopped happening and, and good stuff started. And, and that was at church and just fitness. And from there, the Lord has just continued to, um, you know, bless me and now my wife and now our children. Um, you know, Ryan mentioned that my day job is, uh, is, is a professional role, which I just can't get over. I mean, I'm not a business professional, and, but they, they keep giving me, you know, promotions and telling me I'm doing a good job. Um, but I just, I'm like, okay, I mean, I'm a creative posing as a business professional, but he continues to, <laughs> he continues to, to, to bless that um, career. And, um, and so, yeah, now, you know, here we are. I'm, I actually can't uh, stay this morning. Uh, in 2011, um, started a production company with a friend of mine, and as Ryan said, so Ryan said six books. There's a asterisk next to that. Three of them are graphic novels. So I don't know if you guys want to count those as as like books. I mean, there there's a lot of pictures um, involved. Uh, but we are uh, <laughs> we're uh, in production on a on a video series um, uh, that's called Resilience Transmissions. Um, and the, uh, I'll just say that the punchline is, is we're hoping to punch into culture uh, in the uh, marketplace of ideas to create the groundwork for um, nothing short of revival. Um, and so we'll see what, what God has in store for all of this work that we've poured into it um, over the years now, well over a decade. Um, but yeah, that's my story. Um, thanks for listening. I, I, I hope there was something in it that blessed uh, someone here today. Thank you, Matthew. What a, what a blessing to hear how God has worked in his life. And I tell you, one of the privileges I've had over the, the last number of years is when, when new members, new people come into the church and I get to sit down and, and talk with them. And, and I, I remember the day that I sat down with Matthew and Alex in my office and just, just heard their story. And it, it's just such a, a great testimony and a tribute to the way that, that God works in lives. And, and I know that each of us uh, could stand and, and, and give our story and share, share an account of, of where we were before we knew Christ and how he came in and, and has transformed us. And if you haven't had that opportunity to make that decision yet, this may be a day to consider that, to consider what life would look like uh, by, by turning over the reins to Jesus Christ and seeing, seeing what he would do. But thank you, Matthew, for, for, for a solid testimony. We're sure grateful that you and your family are part of our church family, and I hope you guys can get to know him and his, uh, his family in the days ahead. 
Well, at this time, I want to take a moment and introduce to you Steve Scheibner. Uh, Steve is, uh, is our guest speaker today. He's come to us uh, from North Carolina, and uh, he is uh, uh, married. His wife's name is Megan, and they have eight children. And uh, most of us uh, came today knowing that Steve is a commercial airline pilot. Much of what he is going to share with us today is related to, to an event uh, or a series of events that, that took place in his life as a commercial airline pilot. He is a first officer for American Airlines and currently flies the Boeing 757 and 767. And uh, he's, he does that out of, out of New York. And uh, he's also a retired naval aviator. Uh, with the rank, he retired with the rank of commander. He was deployed three times during his service to our country. So thank you also for, for your service in that capacity. Uh, in addition, Steve has also been a bivocational pastor, and he planted Cornerstone Baptist Church in Georgetown, Maine. He also went and completed a couple of degrees, master's degrees at uh, Calvary Baptist Seminary, and then completed a doctorate of ministry at Gordon-Conwell Seminary. Steve is also the president of Character Health Corporation, <clears throat> and this is a conference ministry that equips parents to train the next generation of character-healthy leaders. And I know that he has a table here, and you've probably uh, seen that as you came through, that there's some resources available in the lobby. He is the author of a number of books and studies. He and his wife uh, have uh, traveled extensively speaking at conferences and events. He's also been a guest uh, on a radio program with James Dobson, as well as a television program with, with Glenn Beck. Uh, but for, day, for today, he is our guest, and we are grateful uh, that Steve has been able to come to us from North Carolina. And uh, please, uh, I, I want us to, to welcome him. He's going to start with a video. So if you would, let's go ahead and welcome him now. Thank you. Because he's going to come up right after a video, and so I wanted us to be able to give him a warm welcome. So at this time, uh, Michael, if you wouldn't mind, start the video, and then when, uh, when that's over, he'll come up and share. On an emotional level, at first, it didn't really sink in. And I think a lot of people that are close to an event like that, you know, you're kind of in a sort of a dream state for a little bit. You're kind of trying to figure out what happened. And, and uh, I finally started to piece it all together uh, later on that evening. And when he finally did get a hold of me, he, he just kept saying, it wasn't me. Don't worry, it wasn't me. Uh, well, I've been with American Airlines since 1991, so we're coming up on my 20th anniversary with American. Uh, I've been a pilot a little bit longer than that. I was first uh, employed by the Navy. I flew P-3s uh, out of Brunswick, Maine, and uh, I was on active duty for eight years. I got about 3,500 hours of P-3 uh, time in those eight years, uh, and then I got hired by American Airlines, and currently I fly the Boeing 757 and 767 airplanes. It's interesting because you don't know what's going to happen September 11th when you're living September 10th. And I just remember September 10th because S September in New England is beautiful. It's not quite fall, but it's, it's cooler than it would be other places. And I'd taken them to the library, and I was sitting outside drinking a coffee while they were in the library. And for the first time, really thanking the Lord because I felt safe. I thought, wow, we're all here, and it's safe and what in the world could ever happen in Georgetown, Maine. September 10th is a date that means, you know, a great deal to me because uh, I did what I normally do on uh, September 10th. The day before I become available to go flying and my flying is in blocks of days of availability. So I was available to go flying on September 11th. So at about three o'clock in the afternoon on September 10th, I sat down at the computer and I, I logged in like I normally do and to check to see if there was any unassigned flying for the next day. And sure enough, there was one trip that was available on September 11th. It was American Airlines uh, Flight 11 out of Boston's Logan Airport uh, to Los Angeles. It was a two-day trip, got back on the second day, left, I think, at about, I don't know, 7.40, 7.45 in the morning, something around that time frame. 
Uh, and I looked at it, and there was no uh, pilot assigned to it yet. So the next thing that I, that what I do is I go and check and see uh, if there's any reserve pilots available. Now, I know I'm available, but there might be some other guys available. And it just so happened on September 11th, 2001, uh, there was only one guy available to go flying on that day, and that was me. So I've been through this drill a lot of times over the years. Uh, I went and I, I, in fact, I told my wife, I said, um, I said, I'm going to Los Angeles tomorrow. Uh, I went out to the car and I opened up the trunk and I got my, my uh, dirty luggage out of the trunk and I threw it in the wash machine and I packed my bags with the new clean stuff and took it back out to the car and I said, I'm going to LA. And at three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, in fact, in those days, uh, what's called crew scheduling at American Airlines would actually assign my name to that trip. I ironed his shirt, which I always do, and put his epaulets on his shoulder and found the ID and, you know, made sure he had everything packed he needed. And we just prepare. When you're a, um, when you're a military family, you prepare in a certain way. When you're an airline family, it's the same thing. There's just a routine and kind of a checklist you go through to prepare for dad to leave on a trip. The, the final assignment comes via the phone call. So they make you know, positive contact communication with you. It's not just in the computer. They'll call and they'll say, hey, want to let you know you've been assigned a trip. Now, I, I might know that already by looking into the computer. I could already see that. But uh, a real person will call you and say, Scheibner, it's now your trip. And now at that point, once you have that phone conversation, even a, if a line pilot wants to, they can't bump you off that trip. So they've only got a 30-minute window of opportunity. Once that phone call gets made, it's a done deal. I waited for the phone call. And the phone never rang, um, which is not completely unusual. It's not the norm, but it's not completely out of the question either. In fact, I didn't even think about it for a while. Uh, it was later on that evening. I thought, hey, you know, they never assigned that trip to me. And then I really didn't give it another thought because well, what that means is I still get paid, but I've got, I've got tomorrow off. I'm still available to go flying, but you know, they never finalized an assignment. So I guess I can, you know, brush off my ambitions to do something else that day. What was taking place, uh, unaware, I was unaware of, uh, was the fact that a, a fellow by the name of Tom McGinnis, uh, who was one of those line-holding pilots, a little bit senior to me, uh, Tom was celebrating his birthday on September 10th with his wife and his children. And Tom did what I did that afternoon. About 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he went over to the computer, and he logged in, and he looked, and he saw that that flight was open, but my name had been penciled in. And he knew he was in, still in that 30-minute window of opportunity. Uh, so Tom called down to American Airlines and said, hey, you know, I just want to check with you. Am I legal to take this trip? In other words, can I bump Scheibner off that trip? And uh, they did what they do with the computer down there, and they got back to him and said, yep, you're, you're legal for that trip, but you've got to give us a call back in the next, you know, 20 minutes, uh, or else we're going to finalize the assignment. I assume that Tom had some sort of conversation with his wife, uh, and he called back. He called American Airlines, and he said, yeah, I'll take that trip. So at that moment, they erased my name off the trip. They assigned it to Tom. I didn't know any different because they never called. And uh, Tom showed up for work that day on September 11th. As you recall, on the East Coast, it was a beautiful day that day. They pushed back off the gate on time, and uh, they took off on time, and they, uh, Tom was actually flying. It was his leg to Los Angeles that day. And... Uh, they flew up to about 23,000 feet, and Tom engaged the autopilot to take him the rest of the way to Los Angeles. And at that moment, uh, all hell broke loose on the airplane. I mean, there's not another way to, to express it. The cockpit's not answering. Somebody's stabbed in business class. And um, I think there's mates that we can't breathe. I, I don't know. I think we're getting hijacked. Which flight do you want? Flight 12. Flight 12, okay. No, we're on flight 11 right now. This is flight 11. It's flight 11. I'm sorry, Nitty. Boston to Los Angeles. Yes. In what seat are you at? Ma'am, are you there? Yes. What 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 seat are you in? Ma'am, what seat are you in? We just left Boston. We're up in the air. I know. We're supposed to go to L.A., and the cockpit's not answering their phone. We're okay, but what seat point. are you sitting in? What's the number of your seat? Okay, I'm in my jump seat right now. Okay. At 3R. Okay, you're the flight attendant? Our number one has been stabbed, and our five has been stabbed. Can anybody get up to the cockpit? Can anybody get up to the cockpit? 
We can't even get into the cockpit. We don't know who's up there. Is anybody still there? Yes, we're still here. Okay. I'm staying on the line as well. Okay. What's going on, honey? Okay, the aircraft is erratic again. Bottom is very erratic. Betty, talk to me. Betty, are you there? Betty? have a TV on, I didn't have a radio on, we were just doing our schoolwork and, um, and pretty soon the, the head contractor called me. Um, his guys had called him because they realized that Steve wasn't home and he called me and said, you know, where is Steve today? And I said, well, he's in, at the Navy. He had gone to work for the Navy that day since he didn't get an airline trip. And it, the problem with the contractors was they were scared. They thought he had been on that flight and they were going to be dealing with this distraught woman who had just lost her husband. Um, it really started to come home to me, the emotional gravity of what happened when my cell phone started to ring. But uh, a secretary at an, a school that I used to attend uh, looked up my cell phone number and she was the first person to call. And uh, I answered the phone and uh, Evie was on the end of the phone and she heard my voice and she started crying. And uh, when she started crying, I, I started crying. And uh, so uh, she was just happy to hear my voice. And it wasn't two minutes after I got off with her that somebody else called, friends of ours from down in Texas. And I thought, you know, I, I need to get ahead of this and make some phone calls. So I, I called home and I, I called to different places. I still didn't realize that that was the flight that I was supposed to be on. You know, I'm watching it on TV like everybody else. And it didn't click with me. I knew the flight number and everything. It still didn't click with me. When it finally clicked with me was later on that evening. I thought, you know, I wonder who was on that flight. And I thought, well, maybe I can go find out the names because the media wasn't going to give you the names for a few days. But maybe there's a way through the login process at American to find out the names. And so I did. I did what I did the day before on September 10th. I logged in. And when the screen came up in front of me, it looked exactly like it did the day before when it had that trip and it had my name penciled in. Except this time, it had this trip sequence. My name wasn't there, and it said these three words, sequence failed continuity. That's code at the airlines for the trip never made it to its destination. Wow, what an understatement. <laughs> sequence failed continuity. And at that moment, when I got that visual look at the screen, I was overwhelmed. It, uh, I, I said, you know what? I packed my bags to go on that trip. And then I was even more curious who had bumped me. But uh, the, the words can't describe th th that moment of, of realizing that you should have been someplace. And you asked me about guilt a little while ago. Yeah, you do have a twinge of guilt. 20 years ago, I wrote a life objective. And my life objective goes like this. It's to seek, trust, and glorify God through humble service and continual prayer to raise up qualified disciples as quickly as possible so that someday I might hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. The events of September 11th took that life objective that I already had and it intensified it for me. The fire just keeps getting hotter as I get older. But someday, I want to stand in the Lord's presence, and I want him to say, well done. I would hate to get in God's presence and have him say, oh, yeah, Scheibner, I see your name's down here. Well, you know, have a seat. I need to hear the Lord say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what's on my plate, and that's what's driving me these days. Um, why does God take one and, and leave another? It's not because um, I'm a better person, or, or God wanted to do more with me than he wanted to with Tom. I, I think in God's providence, 
Uh, that's obviously his choice. What has stuck with me all these years is the fact that he did leave me behind, is that I need to act like I'm living on borrowed time, because I am. I can look and see my smoking hole, and it was on national TV, and I saw where I should have died, but I didn't. And now, there's an obligation that comes with that. I've got to live my days with a sense of urgency. I have to make sure I get the most out of them, and not the most for me. That's, I think we, we live in a world where everybody's kind of out to get the most for them. This is not about me. This is about the distinct privilege I've been given to know that somebody died in my place. What I know is that somebody died in my place not once, but twice. That's where God comes into the whole thing for me. See, Tom sat in a seat that I was qualified to sit in. And, and by all rights, I, that was my seat that day. I should have been in that seat. In fact, I've sat in the very seat of that airplane that Tom was in. I've flown all of the, the 757s and 767s American Airlines owned. So I know what it's like literally to sit in that seat. But I am still, all these years later, still qualified to sit in that seat. And I could have. But Tom didn't die for my sins. You see, God sent his own son to die for my sins. Jesus Christ was the other one who died in my place. And he hung and he bled and he suffered on a cross to pay a price for me that I wasn't qualified to pay. I couldn't have hung on the cross. I didn't have the same qualifications. So one guy sat in a seat that I should have sat in, the other hung and bled on a cross. One is far more significant than the other. That's not to trivialize what happened to Tom. It's to elevate um, and glorify what God did for me and you know, for mankind on the cross. I'm Steve Scheibner. It's a pleasure to be with you today. You guys look like you need to exhale or something. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I, uh, I've seen that film 500 times. Uh, it was made for the 10th anniversary of 9-11, which is now 11 years ago, and 9-11 was 21 years ago. It's really hard to fathom all of that. So much has happened in the world since 9-11. Uh, and uh, it's just mind-boggling to me that that many years has gone by. As you're looking at me, you're going, is that the guy in the film? Yeah, I'm... I have to look at the film the same way you do, and I go, who was that young 50-year-old guy back then? And now I'm 62, and, but, you know, it happens to all of us, right, guys? It's just time marches on. And, uh, but uh, that, it's an incredible film. I think the, the sign of a really well-made film is you have the same response to it every time you watch it. Think about your kids and how many times they'll watch the same movie over and over again and laugh at the same silly jokes. But uh, every time the filmmaker takes you up on the airplane and, and Betty, the flight attendant, is talking to the people on the ground, it's just still hard for me to hear Betty's voice because Betty was a friend of mine. And uh, I recently ran into a, a new flight attendant at American Airlines, a young Korean uh, gal, and she looked, she was a spitting image of Betty. And I, I think she might have thought I was an old creeper or something. I, she was on my flight, and I just kept staring at her. And I, I just couldn't get over how much she looked like Betty. It was like Betty all over again. But uh, it's, uh, it's still hard to hear Betty's voice. And Betty, what a professional she was. Betty was ushered to the back of the airplane by the terrorists. Betty had grabbed one of the telephones that was at the seats in those days. And in those days, some of the airplanes at American Airlines had um, phones at some of the seats, and you could run your credit card. And if you wanted to pay 8 or $9 a minute, you could make a phone call from the seat. Um, they've gotten rid of those from the airplane, um, not because of 9-11, but I think um, nobody wanted to pay 8 or $9 minute, dollars a minute to make a phone call or, more importantly, sit next to somebody else who was, okay? That was probably the bigger deal. But Betty had run her own personal credit card and called security at American Airlines and was gathering information on the airplane to pass it to the people on the ground. So you know what's going to happen to Betty when uh, the terrorists find her on the phone, right? She's going to be the next victim. So just a, a tremendously courageous uh, gal and still hard to hear her voice. Now, uh, at the very end of the film, 
uh, a name came up, and it said a film by Peter Scheibner. And I'm Steve Scheibner. I'm the pilot guy. I'm still working for American Airlines. I've got a couple of years to go still. Uh, but Peter Scheibner is my oldest son, and that's who made that film. Peter is a professional filmmaker. He's based out of Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. He travels all around the country and the world really making films. He's very successful at what he does. But that was Peter's um, senior project when he was graduating from filmmaking school. So 11 years ago, before he got established in his current business, he had to finish his degree. And uh, the final project they told him was, you have to make a 15-minute film uh, here at the school, kind of like a term paper, if you will. We'll grade it. If we like it, you pass, and you can go on with your career. And uh, uh, Peter was uh, in love at the time. He was engaged to his now wife, and he's still in love. But you know what it's like when you're engaged. He was all Twitter-pated and couldn't think of anything other than romance. And So they had told him they c he could make the film on any topic. So he wanted to make a romantic comedy for his little 15-minute film. So he wrote a script, and he submitted it, and it got rejected. Hmm. So he wrote another one, and it got rejected. After the third rejection of this romantic comedy idea, he walked into the film department and said, hey, you told me I could make it on any topic I wanted. What, what's the deal? And they said, well, Peter, we've been talking about it here, and we know your dad's 9-11 story, and we would like to convince you to, to turn your dad's story into a documentary. What do you think? So a little over 11 years ago, Peter prayed about it, and he turned the corner, and he made that documentary in my seat, a little short 15-minute film. Uh, that film now, as of today, has been viewed in every country around the world. It's been viewed about 3 million times on YouTube. Uh, YouTube tells us that 3 million views translates into roughly about 15 million people worldwide have viewed that film. Because many people will watch it over and over again. And, and uh, it's just an absolutely incredible thing. But this, it's a God thing, right? Because uh, all Peter wanted to do was graduate from school. But God had something else he wanted to do with that film. But I think you guys will agree with me on this. That film you just watched now, that's about as far away from a romantic comedy as you could possibly get, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, God does some amazing things without much to work with, if you understand what I'm talking about. So uh, let me, uh, before I jump into what old Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story, uh, let me show you two things real quick. One is the film you just watched. And I bring stacks and stacks of this thing on DVD. Uh, and I like the personal touch. Uh, and you're watching that film right now, and maybe you're thinking of a friend or a neighbor or a coworker or a distant relative, that person that you've been praying for for some time, uh, the person that you would love to come to know the Lord, but they're probably never going to go to church with you. You know who I'm talking about? And uh, I've got a couple people in my life that fall in that category. This is an innovative way to get the gospel in their hands. Say, so, hey, I went to an event the other day. I caught this pilot guy, uh, and he's got a short story. It's only 15 minutes. Grab one of these DVDs and hand it to him and then pray. Follow up a few days later and say, hey, what would you think about that pilot guy's story? I think what you'll find out is that this little DVD will open up the, uh, the opportunity uh, to start a conversation that you've been praying would open for a long time. All right? So take me up on this. I've got stacks and stacks. There's a little charge for these, but it's just enough to cover our expense. And the other now is the book. Now, the book is called In My Seat. And I'm gonna, I don't have enough hands here for this, but let me get into the book. Because I want to read to you just a little excerpt out of the book. And there's that point in the, in the film where we're talking about the, the phone not ringing and how kind of unusual that was for our family. Not completely unheard of, but unusual. And my wife, Megan, wrote the book, that beautiful blonde in the film. And I don't, I don't know if uh, my son used a different lens on her or not, but she looks like she's about 28 years old in that film. I mean, he did a great job by his mom, right? And I'm not a cradle robber. She's my age. Uh, but, oh, my word, she looks great. And, uh, but Megan has a gift. And uh, Megan has written uh, probably a dozen books or more. Uh, and reading one of Megan's books is like having a cup of coffee with your best friend. You just keep turning the page. She's got this conversational style, and she just connects with people um, in her books. And on the table out there, I bought a bunch of her books and some of ours together from our ministry. And guys, do me a favor. Take your wife home a gift from this morning. I don't want to lug that stuff back with me, if you know what I mean. Right? It's really good stuff. There's some marriage books out there. There's a Christmas book and some other things. But this one called In My Seat is about the 9-11 story. And there's some background in this book that you won't get anyplace else other than from a line pilot who worked for American Airlines at the time. So she writes this. It's called The Sleep of the Unaware. She says the no phone call wasn't completely unheard of for our family. In Steve's time in American Airlines, there had been about three times that we prepared for him to leave, and the phone never rang. Sometimes we wishfully joked, perhaps you'll get bumped from your trip and be able to hang out with us today. But usually that just didn't happen. For us, no phone call meant more time with Dad, and he'd still get paid. Not a bad deal. 
So that evening, back into the closet went the airline uniform, and instead we prepared Steve's Navy uniform. The unexpected day off from the airlines provided an opportunity to spend time working on the Navy base. Again, I ironed another uniform and made sure his insignia were in place. Now with a firm plan for Tuesday the 11th, we tucked the kids in bed and headed upstairs ourselves. 45 minutes away, Muhammad Atta spent the evening in a rented hotel room. No family dinner for him. Instead, he went to the local pizza hut and then returned to his room, eager to perform his prescribed rituals in anticipation of the next day's events. While we slept in Georgetown, Maine, Muhammad Atta stayed awake, fueling his hatred and evil plans in Portland, Maine. In a hotel that we passed on uh, each trip to the big city of Portland, Steve's would-be assassin made his final preparations, and yet we slept peacefully. I can only speculate about what was going on in the McGinnis household that evening. Their lives looked so much like ours on paper, military background, airline pilot, active in their church. I picture them going through the same pre-trip rituals that Steve and I performed. I'm sure Tom was in bed early. He'd have to be at Logan first thing Tuesday morning to pre-flight the plane, uh, airplane for Flight 11 to Los Angeles. Like us, they would sleep the sleep of the unaware. Unaware that Monday night would be their final family night together. Unaware that Tom's 42nd birthday would be his last. Unaware that life as they knew it was about to change forever. And it goes on from there. It's a really good book. September 11, 2001 is what I call a major life event. It's one of those moments where your brain takes a little snapshot of exactly where you were. And as I'm describing that to you right now, you can picture exactly where you were on September 11th. And, and many times, even the feelings come rushing back to you. You can picture that first television screen you first saw on that day. And that, and, and that feeling came back of uh, helplessness, right? You looked at the screen, and at first you had to work through denial. Maybe you asked somebody next to you, is that, is that really happening? Is that for real? Yeah, it's really happening. And it took a minute or so to work through denial. And then um, that feeling of helplessness, we hate that as Americans. We absolutely hate that, especially as American men. You want to charge into the battle. You want to do something about it. But we had to stand there all day long and just watch those buildings burn and collapse, helpless to do anything about it. It's really a hard feeling. Uh, I think God puts that little camera in our brains for a reason. And the reason is this. From time to time in life, not very often, but from time to time in life, we need to stop and focus on that which is most important and exclude that which is least important. And we did it on that day. We did it for the next few weeks and even a couple of months. Remember Congress? Remember them? They were all hugging each other and getting along. That didn't last very long, did it? Right? Right? Because we just we let the old ways settle back in. But there was that moment where we had put our priorities right. All I wanted to do that day was go home and hug my wife and my kids. That was it. it the whole world came to a stop. Work wasn't important. School wasn't important. Nothing needed to get done that day other than taking care of your priorities. Now, I get asked two questions primarily, and the two questions I've been asked over now the last 21 years since 9-11 well, is, uh, number one, how do you like flying airplanes? And number two, uh, why do you think God spared your life? And uh, the, the first question is a whole lot easier to answer than the other one. Uh, I love flying airliners. Uh, it's a great job. But most guys that fly a commercial airliner for a living will tell you they, they love what they do for a living. Um, I can't believe I get paid to stare out the window of an airplane, yeah, but I do. It's a pretty good gig when you think about it. But i got to be honest with you, um, flying a commercial jet is a little boring. In fact, it's, it's quite boring. But I'll put it this way. It's 99% boredom punctuated by 1% sheer terror, right? And you just saw the 1% on your screen just now, but the other 99% of what I do is trying to fight fatigue and stay awake. And, and uh, I'm seeing you guys elbowing each other. Are you asking what, what airline that guy say he worked for again? <laughs> Delta. Don't fly Delta. There you go. And, uh, but uh, I'm just being honest with you, right? And once the conversation between you and the other pilot dies down, you know, now what do you do? And uh, I tend to get into a little bit of trouble if I have too much time on my hands. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm, I'm riddled with ADD. I've had it before they knew how to spell it. And I appreciate a building with very few windows because there's squirrels everywhere and I get distracted. Hey, what was I talking about? Okay, oh, yeah, the cockpit. So back up to, so, uh, you know, conversation dies down between you and the other guy. I tend to get myself into trouble when I got too much time on my hands. To illustrate my point, let me take you back a number of years. Uh, this is back in the mid-'90s. I was coming back from Los Angeles to Boston. That was my normal route in those days. We're at 37,000 feet, somewhere over, I think, Kansas. It was just as flat as could be down below. And I'm staring out the window of the airplane, 
And I started counting all the crop circles down on the ground, right? That's a bad idea. That's just like counting sheep when you're tired. You're going to go to sleep next, right? But I'm staring out the window. I'm counting all these circles. And all of a sudden, a thought occurred to me that I hadn't thought about in decades. It took me all the way back to my childhood. And I started laughing. I started totally losing it. You ever have that happen to you? You're in a crowd, and you're trying to get it out, but you can't because you're laughing so hard. And everybody else has got their arms folded, like, dude, what's your problem? And, and so it's just me and the captain up in the cockpit. And every 30 seconds or so, I start to, start to calm down. He goes, Steve, what's so funny? And I, I lose it all over again. So this goes on for about three minutes, which is a long time with a belly laugh. And finally, I calm down one last time. He goes, Steve, what in the world is so funny? And I said, all right, are you ready? Mrs. McWilliams. Yeah, and he looked at me like you're looking at me right now, like, what in the world? I said, all right, let me explain Mrs. McWilliams. Mrs. McWilliams was my fourth grade public school teacher, and Mrs. McWilliams was nasty and rotten to the core. Yes, and I know that some of you are maybe school teachers or you're married to school teachers, and I think that what school teachers do for a living is absolutely fantastic, but perhaps just like one out of every 100,000 teachers ought to look for something else to do for a living, okay? That was our Mrs. McWilliams. And she had these three rulers that she had taped together with masking tape. And she used that thing like an assault stick in the classroom, right? You never heard her coming either. She would troll around behind the students. You had to keep your eyes straight forward. If you put your fingers over the edge of the desk, that was one of her deals. She'd take that big old club of hers and she'd whack your hand against that hard oak desk. Man, that would hurt when she would do that. So I want you to come into the classroom with me for just a minute. You're an eight-year-old boy. It's uh, the middle of November. It's just outside Detroit, Michigan. And the first snow of the season is just starting to gently fall outside. Where do you guys want to be right now? Right? Yeah, trapped with Mrs. McWilliams or outside with the first snow. Now, the first I realized that she was somewhere near me was when the pain radiated from the side of my leg up to my brain. And she had taken that big old switch of hers, and she'd whacked me in the side of the leg for all she was worth. And then she leaned over, and she hissed this in my ear, and I'll never forget what she said that day. She said, Stevie Scheibner, you'll never make a living staring out the window. <laughs> That's right. She was wrong, right? So vindication came for an eight-year-old boy 40-something years later at 37,000 feet over Kansas. Right? Absolutely true story. Some of you had a Mrs. McWilliams in your past. I had a guy in Tampa. I was telling the Mrs. McWilliams joke. And uh, in Tampa, and he came up to me afterwards, and he said, oh, he said, I had a fourth grade teacher, and her name was McWilliams, and she was a nasty lady. I said, well, that is a small world. He said, well, it wasn't Detroit. He said, it's a place that nobody ever heard of. It's called Lincoln Park, Michigan. And I went, oh, his name was Jim. I go, Jim, I only say Detroit because nobody knows where Lincoln Park is. I go, we had the same teacher. We're hugging each other, right? And uh, maybe we should form a Facebook club or something. You know, victims of Mrs. McWilliams. But at any rate, we, we need to laugh here a little bit. Now, what about that other question? You know, how, why did God spare your life, or how has your life changed since 9-11? I mean, it's kind of two sides of the same coin, and that's a, that's a harder question to answer. You don't just wake up one morning and have an answer to a question like that. It's a process. I think part of the process is me telling my story, my God story, to audiences. But uh, um, if you have a Bible, you can turn into it. If you don't, I'm going to turn for you. Uh, and I'm going to turn to John chapter 21, because over the years... Uh, now, at the time, I was pastoring a church and flying for American Airlines. I was quite busy, and I was in the Word and, and doing fine, and I wasn't backsliding, nothing like that. Life was going according to, I think, God's plan for my life. And, but I, I kept wrestling with this idea, why wasn't I on that airplane, right? And that's a, that's a fair question, uh, because I should have been. And, and the Lord kept bringing me back to John chapter 21, and I couldn't figure out why. And then it occurred to me. As I began to think about what a major life event 9-11 was, I thought, well, it's not the only major life event I've lived through in my lifetime. I remember where I was when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. I was only three years old. That's, a, that's pretty young to have a, a lifelong memory. But I remember my parents standing in front of our old 19-inch black and white Philco TV on a TV stand with the rabbit ears. Remember that, you old guys? Right back in the day, and tears were coming down their face, and it was the funeral of the president. Remember where I was when Reagan was shot and the space shuttle Challenger blew up and, you know, all those kind of major life events. And then it occurred to me. I thought, oh, here it is. All of those life events that I just described to you, all put together, pale in comparison to the greatest major life event of all time. And right now I'm speaking about the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Am I right about that? There's a reason you guys gave up a really nice Saturday morning 
and it wasn't for the sandwiches and, and that stuff. You didn't, you didn't even know who I was, but you gave up a Saturday morning. Why? Because we have one thing in common, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, right? 2,000 plus years later, this church fills up every Sunday. Why? Because of the Lord Jesus Christ and the death, burial, and resurrection, more importantly, of that our Lord and Savior. And so with that being said, I thought, why is he taking me back to John 21? John 21 is a unique chapter in the Bible. It's the last chapter in the last gospel written about the earthly ministry of Jesus, and it's after the greatest major life event of all time, and that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I thought, what if we ask the disciples the question, why did God spare your life? Or how has your life changed since 9-11 or since the resurrection? Maybe there's an answer, and there was. There was an answer for me, and there's an answer for us today. Let me read the first four verses, and we'll, get, we'll jump right into this. After these things, Jesus manifests himself again to the, the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. He manifests himself in this way. There were together Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of, of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. So there's seven now of the remaining 11 disciples. Remember, Judas has hung himself. There's only 11. Verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, uh, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, well, we'll come with you. And they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. The stage is now set for Jesus to teach one final lesson to seven of his disciples, right? Uh, when he first called these men, he called them to become fishers of what? Fishers of men, and now they're back out in the boat fishing for what? Fish, not a good use of their time, right? They are uniquely qualified to transform the world for the cause of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is going to show up, and he's going to teach them one final lesson. What's the lesson? He needs to get them to stop living like someday saints and start living like borrowed time believers. And guys, I can't, I can't tell you that there's, there's never been a time in our history that that message is more timely than today. Men, men, we need to stop living like someday saints. The someday saint mentality is, I'll get around to it someday. Whatever it is God wants me to do with my life, I'll get around to it someday. Matt stood up here and shared a testimony about how many years he w wasted getting around to it because he had more interesting, more fun things that he wanted to pursue, and all those things ended up in darkness. Look at the world around us. We, the world around us is falling apart. And guys, this is, I'm off the reservation now with what I'm going to tell you next, but it's pertinent because next week is an important week in this nation. Maybe the most important election we've ever had. And you hear politicians say that? I'm not a politician. I'm not running for anything. Only 50% of evangelical Christians are registered to vote, and only a third of those vote. If we voted, all of us voted, we would overwhelm the system. We would overwhelm the system. You wouldn't have to worry about cheating. We would dominate every election. We stay at home, we wring our hands, and we complain about the way things are, and we have no right to do that if we don't get out and vote. Guys, get out and vote. Get in your car, grab somebody else, and take them to the polling place and pull a lever. I have friends that died in the Navy over the years, right, for your right to pull that lever. How can we stay at home with what's going on around us? All right, so sorry about the mini-sermon, but boy, this is just, as I get older, it's, it's, it's getting to me, right? So get out and do it. All right, now, having said that, let's go back here, all right? So he's going to get these guys to stop living like someday saints and more like borrowed time believers. A borrowed time believer lives every day with a sense of urgency and purpose and passion, uh, knowing that every day on this life is a, on this earth is a precious gift from God. And if you're here today and you've ever had cancer or a life-threatening illness or injury, gentlemen, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you can mark on your calendar that moment you started living on borrowed time. And every day is precious to you. And you want to get the most for the cause of Christ or the kingdom of God. That's important to you. All right, because you want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant someday. You don't want to hear, oh, yeah, I see your name, have a seat. I, that just absolutely drives me. That, that thing I said in the film has been a passion of mine for over 30 years. And I want to get in the Lord's presence and have him say, well done. I don't think that happens by mistake. I think, I think part of it is I've got to return a portion to God of what he's given me out of gratitude in, in a heart that's broken for him. And so with that being said, living like a, a borrowed time believer is, is important for all of us. Now, how's Jesus going to do this? He's going to ask us three questions. 
The first question is this, what are you doing here? Isn't that a great question? <laughs> what are you doing here? Now, don't think I'm being loose with the text. Jesus doesn't say anything in the first four verses. He simply shows up. By showing up, he implies the question, what are you doing here? Why? Because he called these men to become fishers of men. They're back out in the boat fishing for fish. They know they're not supposed to be there. Jesus shows up, and he implies the question, what are you doing here? And, the, and what, are, what are you doing here is not in the boat. What are you doing here on this earth? That's a big picture question. Gentlemen, why did God put you here in the 21st century? Why? To be an 1850s homestead farmer? No, he put the people back then to be like that. There's, there's men's movement that want to put you into a mold of being an 1850s homestead farmer, the patriarchal movement. I, I, don't, I don't subscribe to that. God put me here this day. He knew I would fly airplanes for a living. Can I lead devotions every single day with my kids? Well, no, I'm gone 18 days a month. So how do we work that out? Well, my wife fills in for me. It's okay. She does so with my blessing. And when I can get on the phone with the kids, I would when they were little. But you know what? Sometimes I was just gone. That's the modern world that we live in. But dad was always a spiritual leader, and the kids knew it. The kids knew it. So with that being said, what are you doing here? God has gifted you for this time. What are you doing with that gift? You've got a God story to tell. Who are you telling your story to? Oh, it's not as interesting as your story, Steve. <laughs> it might not be as dramatic, but it's no less important for you to tell it because there's somebody out there that needs to hear it. God put you here for a reason. And if you don't know what that reason is, why aren't you desperately searching for what it is? You need to be clawing and scratching God every day saying, Lord, tell me what that purpose is because I need to tell my story. That's number one. Number two, Jesus speaks in verse five. He says, Jesus therefore said to them, children, do you have any fish? He yells out to the boat. I love this. You ever wonder why God ever asks a question? Let that sink in for a minute, Okay. He already knows the answer, <laughs> and it's always for our benefit, never for his. And you also know what it's like when you're cold and tired and cranky and hungry and maybe a little bit embarrassed and you haven't caught any fish, right? You want to cut off the conversation. So one of the guys in the boat yells this back, no. <laughs> I love this. Aren't you glad that God doesn't accept no for an answer from you? Think about where your walk with Christ would be if he had accepted no the first time and walked away. Right? And so, so Jesus puts a smile on his face. He's going to walk these guys back down memory lane. He says, take that net you've got in the boat and throw it on the other side. Back in Luke chapter 5, when he first met Peter, uh, Peter had been out fishing all night, hadn't caught any fish. Jesus shows up says, throw the net on the other side. Doesn't make any sense. He does it anyway. He throws it out. It fills up with fish so quickly, he can hardly haul it in. Guess what's going to happen in John 21? They're going to obey the voice of the Lord. They, they throw the net on the other side. It fills up with fish so quickly, they can hardly haul it in. There's only one guy that fishes like this. That's Jesus. Peter gets it right away. Peter's pretty quick on this. He goes, I know that who that is now. He gets so excited, he jumps out of the boat and he swims to shore. That's pretty excited, right? He goes up soaking wet. He's greeting the Lord, right? The other guys are rowing the boat back with the heavy nets. Thanks a lot, Peter. You know. but, you know, they're, but he's a good guy. So they get back to the shore. While they get out of the boat to go greet the Lord, Peter grabs those nets and he's pulling them up on the shore. And the fish are flopping around and you can smell the fish and see the fish. And Peter now is reunited with Jesus in his resurrected body. Someday, gentlemen, we're going to get to see that moment face to face. You're going to get to see the, the scars on his head from the thorn of crowns and the holes in his hands and the hole in his side from the spear. Peter's in that moment right now. And what does Peter do? Verse 11, he stops to take time to count the fish. 153 large fish. Somebody counted them. Peter most likely was the guy that did that. It gives you a little insight to where Peter is. Peter's excited to be back with the Lord, don't get me wrong, but Peter's also excited about those fish. What's the difference between those? One is temporary and the other is eternal. The fish are going to rot and smell and decay in a day or two or three, and you're going to have to go out and do it all over again. And if you had time to spend time with the fish or you had time to spend time with Jesus and learn eternal truths, which one would you prefer? Well, here in the classroom in the church, we go, oh, Steve, I got that one right. I'd prefer to spend time with Jesus. Really? How much time do you spend with him on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis? When was the last time you cracked your Bible open? Sorry, guys. The, the, I live in the same world you do. I was a pastor. There were times as a pastor where I'd be doing sermon prep and I hadn't had a quiet time in 10 days. You go, how's that possible? Well, I'm just busy. I'm busy serving the Lord. I'm busy. And you get, you get busy and distracted and you don't take care of the things that are important. The things that are eternal, you take care of the things that are temporary, like the first next person in front of you. I understand that. But gentlemen, we have to rearrange our priorities. Remember why God put that camera in our brains? For a reason. Rearrange our priorities. So the second question now for us this morning is this. 
what are you fishing for in life, really? What are you fishing for in this life, really, specifically? Uh, and if you're not sure what you're fishing for in this life specifically, ask your calendar and your checkbook. What you spend your time and your money on is what you're really fishing for. Oh, I got a great boat. I got a great truck. I got a great uh, RV. I got a, you know, those are the things that you're, you're excited about and passionate about. Why are you not passionate about the Lord? So, again, gentlemen, what we spend our time and our money on is what we're fishing for in life, really. Um, verse 12 and 13 I love. Uh, verse 12, gentlemen, is what I call man breakfast. It says, Jesus came to them uh, and, and had to have breakfast, but none of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Now, guys, you get this. There's a few ladies in the room, so ladies, I'll explain this one to you. All right, when guys get together for breakfast, this is going to shock you, there's no talking required. We can sit and grunt at each other like a bunch of cavemen for the better part of, what, half an hour? We did. We just did it. Pass the salts about as deep as the conversation gets. And, and uh, not, no significant conversation goes on. The ladies, that's a foreign concept to them because they have to talk and, and interact in that way. But, gentlemen, we can just grunt at each other. But this is more than just man breakfast in verse 12. In fact, the tension is so thick right now, you can cut it with a knife. And to, to defend these guys on their behalf, nobody's going to be the first fool to open his mouth because they know they're not supposed to be back in the boat fishing for fish. And Jesus is just serving breakfast. Now, did you ever wonder when it all clicks for these guys? Especially Peter, because we pick on Peter a lot. Next time we see Peter in the scriptures, by the way, is in the book of Acts. Peter is leading thousands to faith in Christ. Somewhere between John 21 and the next time we see him, Peter gets it. All right? I think it's in verse 13. Verse 13 is what I call a flyover verse. Look at this. Jesus came and took the bread and gave them and the fish likewise. And you go, uh, okay, I don't get it. We know what's on the menu. It's the action that goes with it. Put yourself in the shoes of these seven men. For you, when was the last time Jesus himself, in person, took a piece of bread, broke it, and handed it to you? You see where we are right now? I'll give you a hint. It was about a week ago for you. It was in a place called the Upper Room, now known as the Last Supper. And the last time Jesus took a piece of bread and broke it to you prior to the crucifixion, prior to the resurrection, what did he say? He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you gather together in remembrance of me. Everything in that gesture, in that statement about going fishing for men, nothing in that about going fishing for fish. And it, without uh, uttering a word, Jesus delivers the most powerful message yet. He simply takes a piece of bread in John 21, breaks it, looks him in the eye one by one, and hands it to him. And if it had been me, I would have cried like a little baby. These guys got it. But to drive the point home, now... Jesus turns his attention to Peter. Peter was the natural leader of the group. And in verse 15, 16, and 17, he asked him that now famous question, do you love me more than these? Right? You guys are familiar with that? Now, the these could be the other men. The these could be the distractions of life. The these could be the 153 large fish flopping around in the nets during our silent man breakfast. My vote is this. I think it's the fish. I think Jesus took uh, Peter by the shoulder, walked him over by the fish, and said, um, Peter, do you love me more than these? You know, implied in that was, you know, you, you took a bunch of time to count all those fish when you could have been talking to me. But, it, it, and, 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 and now he asked him that question three times. He had to wound Peter finally, because Peter was holding back on him the whole time, right? He finally had, and sometimes the Lord has to wound us, gentlemen, to get our attention, because we're just thick. We are, we're men. I can do one thing at a time, and please don't ask me to go into the pantry and find the peanut butter. I just can't do it. It's, it's pathologically impossible. And I'll, stay, I'll stand in there for an hour looking for it, and my wife will reach over my shoulder, and she'll go, it's right there. There's just some things we can't do. But the things that we can do are, well, <laughs> the ladies are all laughing. Oh, yeah, that's true. Right? There are things that we can do, gentlemen. And um, so, but sometimes Jesus has to get our attention in a, you know, kind of a rough way, and he does so with Peter. The final question this morning is this. What do you love more than Jesus? Is that a fair question? That's really what he's asking. Saying, Peter, what do you love more than me? Do you love these other guys? Do you love these fish? What do you, you love a lot of things more than you love me. And I need to see you kind of respond to me differently than you do to these other things. Peter, those are temporary. They're, they're going to they're gonna be gone in a day or two or three. I'm eternal. You should spend your time here. That's your priority. Gentlemen, that is our priority, Jesus himself. 
Um, you know, you can, uh, you can pull a lever in a, in a voting booth. And is that temporary? Yeah, sure it is. Uh, and sometimes we have to do temporary things, but we do it for eternal reasons. That's the important part. So don't be pulling a lever that has temporary consequences if you're not thinking eternally. Uh, so now, the Lord brought all three of these questions into my life on September 11th, 2001. How did he do that? By showing me my own mortality. I'm here this morning to tell you I know what it's like to have somebody die in my place. Not once, but twice. And once was enough. Tom, the pilot who bumped me off that trip, Tom would be the first guy to tell you he did not die for Steve's sins. Now, how can I say that with any confidence? Here's a silver lining on this little dark story of mine. Tom McGinnis had a solid testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. And on September 11, 2001, Tom went straight from that bloody cockpit straight into the arms of the Lord. But the other who died for me and the other who died for Tom and the other who died for you is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he hung and he bled and he suffered on a cross to pay a price that he and he alone was uniquely qualified to pay. You and I couldn't have hung on the cross. We didn't have the same qualifications. Only one has ever been qualified to, 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 to fulfill the just righteousness of God, the lamb who was worthy, right? He was worthy of God's uh, justice and, and righteousness. He's the only one that could pay the price. Why did he do it? Why would Jesus go and pay a price for you and me, such wretched sinners? Why would he do it? Two reasons. Number one, out of faithful obedience to God the Father. That's how much Jesus loves the Father. And number two, out of a deep and abiding love for you and me, the object of his passion. He loved you that much that he went and gave his own life so that you could have eternal life. That's adaptation of John 3.16 right there. But right now, we put up a bunch of walls and barriers. We put our arm out like that someday saint. We go, oh, Steve, yeah, but you know what? Uh, if, if you knew what I was into or the things I've done in my life or the dark secrets I've hidden or the things I'm into right now, uh, the, the, I, the, there's no way that God could love me. And I, I think I need, to, I, I need to clean up my act for a little bit before I can kind of talk about what you're talking about right now. No, you, you don't understand it. God has known everything from the beginning of time to the end of time. He knew every sin you would ever commit in your entire life, every sin you're currently committing, and every sin you're going to commit for the rest of your life. Knowing all of that ahead of time, he still sent his son to die for you on the cross. How can you keep that type of love at arm's length like a someday saint? Shame on you if you do. That type of love demands a response on our part. One way or another, yes or no. How would you deal with Jesus Christ, because gentlemen, we're all mortal. Just look in the mirror. All right, we're all getting there, and uh, and, and you got to realize that someday you're going to step from this existence into another one. What's it going to look like? Right, and it's the, it's the balls in your court on this one. What are you doing here? What are you fishing for in life, really? And what do you love more than Jesus? And by the way, when you find the answer to that third question, the other two questions fall into line. All right, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege it is to share my God story here today. And each one of us has a God story. Some of us, Lord, maybe it hasn't started yet. Maybe chapter one needs to be written. And uh, we're here today and we've never surrendered our life to Jesus Christ. Uh, I would love to talk to you afterwards. Uh, Pastor Ryan would love to. Pastor Russ would love to. There's other men in this room that you know know the Bible. And uh, I'm going to ask you, if you've never taken that very first step of faith in Jesus Christ, trusting him, asking Jesus to forgive you of your sin. Matt described it. He said, I did it when I was nine years old, but I really nailed it down when I was older. That moment, that moment of coming to faith in Jesus Christ is an important moment for all of us. Grab me or grab one of these other men by the sleeve and say, hey, I, I, I need to talk to you about something. And we'll open up the Bible with you and we'll pray with you and we'll show you what the word of God has to say about it. I would love to have the privilege to do that this morning. I'm in no hurry to get out of here. If you're here today and you've been uh, living that uh, with the Lord for some time, but you've been drifting away like a someday saint, uh, I'm just going to ask you to do a simple thing right now. Uh, you say, Steve, I, I have been living like a someday saint too much, and I, I want to live more like a borrowed time believer. And the Lord's kind of nudging me on a couple of things I need to get around to, and I need to do them now. I would just like to pray for you right now. If you could just slip up your hand, just say, Steve, just pray for me. i got some things I need to get to. All right. I see a couple of hands. Hey, guys, thanks. Yeah, there's several more. All right. Anybody else? Just pray for me. I don't see another hand. All right. hey, wait, don't be too proud to raise your hand. It's just simple. All right. Anybody else? 
Okay, Lord, thank you for those who've raised their hands here. And you can put your hands down, gentlemen. Thank you for those who've raised their hands. And I pray, Lord, that you'd give them the courage to take the next step. Maybe it's when they go home, they need to ask their wife's forgiveness or your children. Uh, it doesn't cost us anything to do that except our pride. Maybe we need to text somebody, call somebody, whatever it is, Lord. But there needs to be a sense of urgency with whatever the next step is. Don't let us get overwhelmed with, with the whole road ahead. Just one thing at a time. Help these men do the next thing that they need to do um, to make that transition from that someday saint to that borrowed time believer. Lord, thank you for the privilege of me being able to share my God story. And I share thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. like to read just one one verse from first uh, Peter and I'll pray for our country first Peter from chapter 2 you are a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praise of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is good to be in your house this morning, and in the stillness of this morning hour, we come near to you. Our times are in your hands, and when I think of everything that has had to happen just to bring us all into this place at this time this morning, I am in awe of your grace and your divine sovereignty. And I acknowledge, Lord, that you are sovereign over all things, every nation, every people, every kingdom, and every ruler of this world. Lord, thank you for this nation that you have blessed many times before. Thank you for those leaders who serve you and take refuge in you. Thank you for those who know that your kingdom is not a place, but rather a relationship that exists wherever men enthrone Jesus as their master of their lives. You have blessed us with a country where we are free to worship without fear. And we thank you for it is by your grace that we enjoy your protection and provision and the ability to come to a place like this today and gather in your name. And yet, Lord, it doesn't take a sharp eye to see what is going on in our world. We are confronted with a great darkness that continues to fall in our nation, and we need the strength to rely only on you, Lord, and not the rulers of this nation, especially those who set themselves against you. So, Lord, I pray that you will give those who rule over us at every level a clear vision of you. May they see who you are in Jesus Christ. And when they get a glimpse of you, of who you really are, may, they, may it determine who they are and what is truly important. And not just who you are in their opinion, but who you truly are. And when they tell us how the world works and what everything means, may you remind them that you are the reason that everything works and you determine what everything means. Lord, when they elevate themselves and minimize you, show them that you are other than everything that is, spotless, blameless, without a single fault, so that they will know you, the Lord our God, and that it is you that turn the hearts of men from evil. May our leaders at every level believe in Jesus, not believe in him like, I believe I ate a great breakfast here this morning, but that they believe in Jesus to the point where they will stake their eternity on the finished work of Christ. That Jesus was God in a human body, lived a perfect life, was alive, died, and ra was raised from the death so that he could provide eternal life. May they come to that knowledge before the door closes. 
And whether they believe it or not, may we trust not in governments or popular cultural ideologies, but only in the righteousness of Christ, which can alone exalt a nation. Lord, may we enter the field of harvest with the full armor you have provided. We don't always get to choose the field on which the battle is fought, and we may not have a clear view of all the options before we must act. And the outcome may not even be what we hope for, but ultimately you have not called us to success but to faithfulness. So in faith, may we always engage the challenges before us, contending for the faith, perhaps not perfectly, but prayerfully, humbly, and with wisdom. So Lord, put down the enemies who are gathered against you, judge the world in righteousness, and bring us safely into your presence to live under the blessing of your rule. And Lord, I ask these things because we, in Christ, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for your own possession, so that we may proclaim the praises of the one who has called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Lord, I pray that we will now face the challenge of our time, being salt and light to this nation and every nation, and that in your power we will serve Christ with courage and honor to the glory of his name. It is in his name that I pray. Amen. Let's continue in prayer for our church and for the ministries of this body. Our fathers, we continue in prayer. We stop to say thank you. Thank you for reaching down and saving our souls. Lord, we were lost without hope. But in your grace and in your mercy, you have opened our eyes to the truth of the gospel. As it was spoken, as it was preached, your spirit worked in our heart to help us see how much of a need we have for our sins to be forgiven and for our relationship to be made right with you. And we thank you so much for your kindness in opening our eyes and bringing us into faith. Lord, we thank you for the change that that has brought into each and every one of our lives, as we've even heard this morning a couple different times. And I do pray for the person here today that hasn't experienced that change of coming to faith in Christ. May today be that day. But for those of us that are followers of Christ, you have placed us into a body of believers. And you have called us to be, as we've already reflected on, salt and light. To be a picture of Christ to a lost and dying world. To be a picture of Christ to our children. That we might be the hands and the feet of our Savior so that we might reflect who he is to them. We are in desperate need of your help to do that. Because we know our own hearts and we know our own struggles and failures in the past to do that. And so, Lord, we confess those failures, but we come to you and we ask that you would be our strength, that you would be uh, with us as we seek to live you out. Lord, we're reminded in John 15 that you are the vine and we are the branches. And without you, we can do nothing. So, Lord, as, as we gather as a body of believers on a Sunday and then throughout the week, you are calling us to do God things, but we cannot do it without your help. So we pray that as we meet on Sundays that you would empower the word of God that goes forward. We thank you for a faithful pastor and pastors that uh, continually are preaching and directing our attention not to uh, the things of this world or to the recent headlines, but to the Word of God. We thank you that they faithfully take us through line by line, verse by verse, your Word and what it has to say to us. And we pray that you would continue to strengthen Ryan as he does that on a daily or on a weekly basis. Lord, we pray for Tim as he does that with our young people and Brad with the 
with the children. We pray for Russ as he oversees so many things as the gospel goes forward as well, that you would just bless them and empower them to continue to preach your word. Lord, we pray for our, our leaders. We pray for Peter and Dick, for David, Dan, Jim, and John as our elder team, that you would uh, continue to bless them and give them uh, direction as they uh, are called to help lead this church. Lord, we pray for our deacons. Uh, Lord, may you continue to use them to serve this body. We pray for our small group leaders as they teach and preach your word as well, that you would use uh, them and, and their skills to bless this body. Lord, we, we pray for uh, our missions. We pray for uh, our community outreach, that you would allow that to be effective and powerful so that others might see Christ through us. But Lord, I pray for each and every person within this body because the church is, is not made up of just its leaders. It is made up of uh, each and every member doing their part. And that requires each and every one of us, Lord, to be growing, to be in your word, to be feeding on you so that we can live you out. Lord, I'm reminded of what Paul says as he prays for the Philippian believers, that it's his prayer that their love would abound more and more with knowledge and discernment so that they can approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the praise and glory of God. Lord, may we be growing in our knowledge of you and our discernment so that we can choose what is right, so that we can be pleasing to you. I pray specifically for the men here this morning, but in our church at Broad as well, that we would be the men that you have called us to be, that we would be doing those things that we know we should be doing. May your spirit empower us to do those. May we as men be filled with the fruit of the spirit. May we, may we be loving and joyful. Lord, may you give us the peace and the patience. Lord, the kindness, the gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, all those things that we need to be the men of God that we need to be. Lord, may we walk faithfully with you. May we lead our families. May we get involved in the body here and serve each other faithfully. Lord, we pray that we would be men that are humble, walking before you with a sense of brokenness and neediness. Lord, we, may we be men that are joyful as we reflect on what you have done in our lives and the change that you have made. May we be men who hunger after the word of God and aren't satisfied by the little morsels that this world gives us, but by the meat of what you have for us. And may we be men that are loving, giving up of ourselves for the good of others. But Lord, we circle back and we remind ourselves, without you, we can do nothing. So we come as broken men, broken people, praying for your grace and for your strength. It's the name of Christ we pray these things. few things before we conclude today. First, I'd like to thank Russ and Danny, who were very instrumental in making today happen. And, and thank you both. Uh, uh, personally, I would like to thank you both. I'd also like to thank the women who served us, came in here, gave up their time this morning, came out here to help us by serving, and it was very much appreciated. Uh, I don't know that I trusted any of you guys who served me sandwiches, but uh, I'm very appreciative to them. I'd also like to thank each of you for coming out. As our speaker said, that we may be borrowed time believers. Let that sink in. And may we take that with us. A couple things before we leave. One is, uh, when we're done... Uh, those who can stay around and help us, Sunday is a coming. We need to put our sanctuary back together, and if you can help us with that, it would be much appreciated. 
a lot of hands, it'll get done quick. This is a men's prayer breakfast. And if you take the program that you had out on your table, and you'll see on the back, you know, we're reminded in, in Scripture, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal, heal their land. What we'd like each table to do, uh, at least one man to lead the group in prayer, you'll see on the back a, a number of opportunities that we can pray. We can never pray too much for others. We can never pray too much for this country. So we just ask that before you leave, that each table take some time, close in prayer, and then go on our way to impact this world. Again, thank you. And if you would, at this time, start prayer at your table. Thank you.